insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG24. Welcome to the ITSP Magazine Podcasts, a modern, innovative multimedia platform broadcasting ideas and connecting minds. You are about to listen to What If Instead Podcast with Alejandro Juarez Crawford and Miriam Plavin Masterman, a show about everyday people reimagining the way things work and tackling the obstacles they face. We explore adventures in democratizing innovation, how the chance to try one's hand at something new affects people and even organizations what powers they discover, and what challenges they face along the way. I think changing user experience is one of the strange, extremely vexing, but you also know it's the kind of thing you probably shouldn't complain about too much, problems of our time, right? There is nothing that makes a person angrier than when Google doesn't work. And yet at the same time, we know, really, it's not the end of the world, right? I'm particularly fascinated when a software update happens and suddenly my whole user experience has been changed to something where I am supposed to just figure out where everything is. Like somehow menus are out of fashion. I don't know, Mim, what's your experience been with this? I would say surprisingly similar. When I'm trying to do something and I go right to the, how do I do this thing on my phone or my computer? Inevitably, it takes me to somebody's how-to list, except all the names are different. Now it's not the settings menu, it's the preferences menu, or it's here, or it's there. And part yeah. of me is like, they're just messing with us. Right. Yeah, they're messing like, with you. <laughs> like, yeah. And, and that's actually what we do, you know, in my software hat. We're like, let's mess with the user. No, I think we're actually trying to make it better. The thing is that I'm sure they've done all kinds of user research. But before we get into that sort of thing, we have an incredible guest today um, whom we're going to announce in just a moment, who actually is a leader in design thinking, but design thinking as it applies to making our world a world that makes sense to live in. And we can get into some of these more trivial experiences when, you know, your Tesla changes the interface just while you're trying to do a car chase or something like that. But I have a feeling we're going to talk with her about some of the really important and urgent uses of that thinking around the world. So today we have the pleasure of being joined by Burmet Stute, who's coming to us from Bishkek City in Kyrgyzstan, very, very, very late at night, and she is an unbelievable good sport for staying up in the middle of the night to speak with us. But she's here today to talk about her amazing work, working for the American University in Central Asia, coordinating their social entrepreneurship program, sustainability, design thinking. She also has done a lot of work in the Global Certificate and Sustainability and Global Enterprise as one of their coordinators. So she's got a ton of great ideas all around user experience, what it means, why it matters so much you know, how we make sense of all these things around us. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me today. Mim and Alejandro, thank you. Mim, of course, is making the assumption, uh, and this is not a safe assumption anymore, Mim, that Bermet is not a cyborg and needs to sleep. So let's, we'll get into that in the interview. (laughs) I'm Alejandro Juarez Crawford, (laughs) and this is my co-host, Mim Plavin Masterman. And we're on a mission to make experiments of your own feel as normal as watching videos on your phone. Welcome to What If Instead, the podcast. But Matt, I wanted to situate this before we begin with the people that you're here to serve. And I wanted to ask you, when you are enabling people to ask our question, what if instead, and respond with experience of our own, in some way that they haven't been able to, what's blocking them? What are you doing about it? Uh, So... Be curious. Mm. Be actually a detective, right, Alejandro? In one of your TED Talks, you talked about detective, <laughs> right? Be detective. Mm-hmm. Be curious. Ask questions. When you ask more questions, then you will learn more. 
And when you learn more, you will get actually more uh, understanding. And then when you get the more understanding, then you may, you may find your solution. Right. And the most recent um, for me, the brightest was actually when I was teaching social entrepreneurship uh, last, not the last spring, of course, I had a group of students that say like they were like very quiet a student and they said, oh, I want to actually create a eco-friendly, sustainable furniture. I was mm. like, what do you mean? Oh, you know, professor, that actually a lot of ways how you can make the furniture more durable uh fire resistant mm. water resistant i was like what is that oh it's a mushroom i was like mm. wow and then we worked on that and um, students were able to create the prototype so the the challenge was that we couldn't we didn't have back then a lab where we could actually try it properly mm. although we tried different actually um we tried to reach out to different laboratories, but the heating, the drying was not suitable for the mycelians. And I got to say, student- fungus furniture sounds really comfortable. Bermit. It does. Like I have this image of the, the soft <laughs> sort of wrinkly part of a mushroom and just kind of gigantic one, right? And, you know, I'm in Wonderland here. Okay, so one thing before we get back to this. So you're going with the like sweet side of mushrooms. I'm going with like the last of us. They're going to eat us. Like, so, <laughs> so this is not, yeah. Sorry, back but, to your. But, but, yeah. No, but all fun with mushrooms mm-hmm. aside, and you got to have fun with mushrooms. It sounds like part of the challenge, Bermet, you gave us this wonderful sequence where you said, we need to innovate the delivery of education. And then you gave us these four things go out, be curious, be a detective, ask the questions, right? Which is, yes. which. And then you gave this example of the students working with the mycelium and needing to find access to a lab where they could make their crazy idea of, you know, mushrooms, we, furniture, durable mushroom furniture, feasible and possible. So can you actually give us a little bit of detail? Talk to us about, um, you know, we, we, we were getting out of the mud, we're working on mushrooms, but we got to go out, be curious, be a detective and ask the questions. Tell us a story. It's about the platform we we're actually using, the Rebel Base, where we, along with all my uh, peers from the global class, um, we use the platform which actually guides students and they come in and they publish their all work and it's get all, gr- all their work gets grilled by their other peers globally not by the actually classmates like within the local co- uh, uh, co- local cohorts and that actually was also that is actually one of the greatest tools and one of the methodologies where we all use uh, globally uh, to really review and uh, follow the students process how they are doing what they're doing in terms of uh, their project success so we what Alejandro said they are out of uh, muds and they are already prototy- prototyping or they are already um, testing maybe prototyped and they are testing mm-hmm. and then they also uh, oh no I need to also say talk about the markets research right because without the market research there is no mm. uh, great or good not great but good business uh, idea that could actually be born mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. so this these are these questions you're talking about asking whether it's can i work with a lab to make the mycelium work or is there a market for this now i i gotta say this sounds really far out what you're describing and I, i'm wondering if you could paint the picture for listeners that may not know what it means to have all these groups around the world together working on something like this, or who may not know what you're talking about when you talked about being grilled globally. What does that mean to someone who's not familiar to any of this, Bermet? And how does it help folks ask those questions? So uh, for us, for us, like for us, I mean, where this is actually, I think, in my opinion, a very innovative way of delivering the education globally, where more than actually five institutions around the world, starting from actually Myanmar last year, we had students from Myanmar. Yes. We also had students from Taiwan, 
uh, and of course, Kyrgyz Republic. Then we go all the way to, no, not all the way, so very close, Bangladesh, then Bulgaria, then Palestine. And then last semester, we had also Ghana and South Africa. And the year pre- previous, we had students from Colombia, Colombia uh, Universidad of, I cannot, I forgot the, the country, Colombia, and obviously Bards. So altogether, and, uh, you know, and also Belarus, sorry, I forgot the Belarusian ones, yeah. We all come together as different students with the different backgrounds. They come in and they say, you know what, I think we all, like, only, for example, Kyrgyz Republic has a problem with education. And when we come in, all is like, uh-oh, like, they have actually the same problem. Oh, I thought only Kyrgyz Republic because we are developing third world country. But America also has a problem or Belarus has the same problem. So they come in all together and students can also work together uh, depending on, not depending, I mean, it doesn't really matter if you're from Kyrgyz Republic, from South Africa and America, but you have actually the same burning situation. You can group team up and then develop the project, whether like you are an article somewhere. And because you are, you have actually the same pain that you are trying to solve and find the cure together, right? And what, what I mean, actually, grilling is uh, every week we actually meet so once in a week, and we invite students to pitch. So this is more mm. of like a the practice, right? It's not a real pitching. So, uh, like steadily, we don't we don't actually fear them. Like say, now you have to pitch. No, every week students come in with their raw presentations, raw data, and then mm. the, we give them five minutes. Right after five minutes, we cut them off, and then there are questions uh, students ask. Most of the time, we encourage students to engage because this is where we're also developing their critical thinking and analytical thinking uh, skills, which are essential currently right now in the developing AI world. Mm. And we call call it actually, should I tell the new term fishbowl? Okay. I might actually fishbowl, like fishbowl. That's what actually we call it. And obviously then we send our students because come on, like five institutions, we have more than 100 students, which actually means sometimes we can get actually 40 projects maximum, wow. right? Maximum. And we break them into breakout rooms and each co-facilitators are sent to those breakout rooms and each team actually, team groups, they have time to present and we always ask them to grill them the fish bowl them right bowl them and uh use that platform called Le- rebel base where they can leave all their com all their feedback or questions so students do not forget what was the question and based on those questions on the feedback students go back and do it again thorough research or uh, improve their presentation or really reanalyze what they have collected through before that class no this is this is fascinating because i'm thinking about as you're when we started the conversation you were talking about the empathy you have for people to sort of get them out of the mud and on one level when you think okay you're going to be grilled in a fishbowl it doesn't sound very empathetic right but i think it does sound scary it sounds intimidating (laughs) it sounds almost like a gladiator arena but then it sounds like the process is somewhat transformative where the students actually are developing empathy through this. So h- how do you get them to come away from what could be a really scary experience with something so positive as empathy mm-hmm. for someone else's situation? Uh, in the past, they were actually students saying, you know what, professor, I don't want to present. I don't want to pitch. I'm scared. I'm shy. I get fear. I get anxiety. But when, once we finished the class, they were like, can we actually, like, I missed the class. I actually missed <laughs> being fishbowled because those fishbowls actually reshaped me within the actual four or five months. Even, let's say four months, like four months, even three months, reshaped my thinking. And yes, at the beginning, it sounds so brutal. Like, yes, like you are talking in front of 100 people that you don't know. And now you have you get to actually, but I always say, this is a life. Like you won't be always saved. 
you need to actually get toughened. You need empathy is the way how you actually provide the feedback. Are you providing the feedback to make them feel good? Like saying, good job, good job. Or <laughs> you are actually providing them a feedback, emphasizing that you want them be better. Yeah. I think the second so, is better. You make me think of Sebastian Crow, who leads this work in Bangladesh, has <laughs> talked about how when he first um, was working on SoulShare, his uh, social venture, he a bunch of people said, this is the best thing in the world. I love it. And he never worked with them again. But it was those who said, there are so many things that aren't going to work here. Here are all the problems that he works with to this day. But I think you're bringing up something really interesting in terms of how we're taught to think when you use grilled globally and in a fishbowl or empathy. And I remember being a, a young person myself and a poet named A.R. Ammons uh, was teaching at Cornell. And he said to us, he said, judge the poem in terms of what it's trying to become. Well, I'll never forget those few words because it changed the idea for me. It said, wait a minute, criticism of the first version of something might actually be helping it with what it's trying to become. And as you spoke, Bermet, you really struck me as you described this process of going out into the field, getting grilled globally, critical and analytical thinking, going into the fishbowl, that maybe what you're describing isn't this terrifying experience of being a goldfish in a bowl because of what that experience is giving us in terms of discovering our powers. That's where you're leading me as you speak. Is that on the right track? Yeah, I think also I want to add one more thing. It's like you need to understand what's at stake, right? It is not the credits what you are receiving. It is actually the experience that you are receiving and how far you can go with that experience. So in my classes, it's more of like an 80% not 80, 90% of practice, right? And 10% of the theory because you learn better while doing. So I want to add, uh, add that there is actually a stake, which is like by your work, you could actually make huge, like the scale of the impact is huge. So so, mm. so can I ask one, one thing to follow up on that is mm. as, as I'm listening to you talk, I mean, what you're doing is so transformative and important how how did you learn to do that was there something specific that happened to you was it sort of the sum total of a whole life of experiences like could you speak to how you've developed it's a very unusual mindset and I mean that as a compliment so I'm just very curious how you kind of got to think that way how did you become Bermetsu yeah <laughs> yes that's my question but <laughs> one, thank you <laughs> Um, I say my family at the global class, the global class where we teach all of my peers. We are sitting in our own offices, comfortable chair or drink, sipping a water, right? And how they make me feel. So how we actually, Which when we meet and we chat with the, all the faculties or facilitators, um, and you listen, right? You listen what they're saying. You listen to what other like students are saying, what they're sharing. And then it becomes actually like another you know, dimension of thinking. I don't know. I think I, I think I, I, I even myself confused with the answer right now. <laughs> but but it's very striking what you're saying when you describe a global family. We're living in this time when we're, so much of our time is on Zoom, even with people that may live in the same city as we do. And the last thing I typically get out of a video conference session, not this one, obviously, but is a feeling of family, right? I traditionally would get a feeling of family from other things, maybe enjoying music or breaking bread. So I really want you to break down for us because it's really a little bit shocking what you've described why do you see those global, that global group of people as a family? What does that mean to you? 
one thing unites us all, our passion to teach, our passion to show the way to students, even with our different like demographics, like age, race, right, sex, everything. Mm. And our passion is one. Our value is one. Mm. And we, they, I, we have all the same empathy towards to actually really teaching this future generation to be more sustainable and preserve the nature for our kids, our next generation. Yeah. So break it down for listeners, though. So there's a shared passion, as you put it so beautifully, for preserving nature for another generation. Right. And actually, the evidence suggests that majorities of young people around the world recognize that as their number one concern. Right. And yet so often we feel as if we're in this disconnected and atomized world where we feel separated from that sense of family and the agency that comes with it. So I want to know from you, Bermet, what's different here? Why? Give us really break down in as in as anecdotal a way as you can. Give an example if you can think of one. Why do you feel as if you're in a family with people in all of these far-flung places you've listed from Colombia to Bangladesh? I think you can see it even from my face that whenever I think about the social entrepreneurship peers, right, it brings me a lot of joy and happiness because last year uh, we actually – had the privilege of meeting in Sofia, Bulgaria, where we discussed the future of this global um, certificate. And th- that was actually for the first time we met, okay? And mm. the fun part was that we've, we've known and we've taught this course for like two years, and that was our first time meeting in, in person. And we shared um, breath. Why? You know? We had actually a lot of fun together. And what I like. I noticed we were having... drinking water before during class. Now we're drinking wine. Is that right? Go on. Excuse me. <laughs> no, miraculously, the water in Sophia turned into wine. <laughs> that was actually a lot of experience. And the diversity, the background is also different, right? So um, they. When we met, it was felt like we didn't have that subordinate, subordinate, right? The like a sense of like, hierarchy and yes, and yes, who was so it's like, subordinate to whom? Yeah, and that made me also appreciate that, regardless of like what title you have, in what status you are in, we were all. Uh, Greeted, I would say, first of all, the way how the leader of the program treats you and the rest actually will catch it on. It's like a virus, right? So if the leader of the program is very open-minded and trying to create a psychologically safe, meaningful availableness, right, in that workplace, that means you are engaged, that means you are dedicated, and that means also you are loyal, to the program and then when you're loyal you are loyal only to your family and sometimes friends so if i have been with this certificate for the third year and i am planning to continue uh, teach and engage with the global certificate program that is actually means it's actually a family you know ma'am i'm sure you have a million questions if I could just ask you, better met to help our listeners understand two things about what you've just described. And first of all, you just talked about a psychologically safe global grilling <laughs> and a and this warm feelings about all these fish bowls. So I'm trying to understand that because many of us are I think many of us are afraid of being criticized and and being put out there. Um, uh, in the way that you've described during this podcast, the other thing, so I want to know what sets that. And then you, you described, uh, uh, think of people around the world who I had a student recently say to me, um, that what was horrible about being in school during COVID was that the professors didn't know his name. 
right? And I've had others talk about how disconnected they've become over the last few years in this decade. So if you could, and this is very hard what I'm asking, but for those of us who may be feeling as if we can't connect in education and collaboration or even with like-minded people who care about the environment or other pressing problems, what have you figured out with this group about how to make this incredible family-like connection where no one's subordinate to no one else and where you describe it as a positive virus in a time where it seems like so many noxious things are contagious physically and otherwise? Mm. Yeah, psychological safety and empathy during the fish bowling. It's very like paradoxical uh, uh, phrase, right? Like psychological safety in the global fishbowl. And where right hmm. now you are presenting your project in front of the hundred people. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's scary. Um, but we must understand that the high pressure makes the diamonds. Okay. And it actually depends on what kind of what kind of actually heat or gas or coal mm. you are using mm. to create mm-hmm. that actually heat, right? Is it actually high quality or low quality? In this term, psychological safety could be: Is it actually high quality? Are, are we? Do we have actually enough faculty members who are capable of right now, like current? Mm. Like, capable of providing a safe space for students to express themselves Uh and be open for the feedback? Uh Or are we using actually very cheap quality coal or whatsoever where we are saying, no, you're wrong. It's like, I think you're in a wrong direction. You need to go and find your out your way. I don't know. Are we saying, let's come, Uh come in and we can figure out together. Or you say, no, like, I don't know. I think you are doing something wrong yourself. Go figure it out. No. (sighs) So that's what, and we all have in a global class, global classroom, right? And with the global faculty, our main goal is to provide a safe zone and make ourselves psychologically, right, available to them where they're having psychological meaningfulness of what they're doing. So this is where the empathy comes in, and this is where actually the how students finding means, right, to solving the social problem, pressing either ecologically, economically, or equity-wise. I don't know. Fascinating. And, and how how did you decide to put your life into this arena? Like, what was it a specific uh, educational experience you had, or was there something that's cause you to say, I'm going to stop what I'm doing and I'm going to go get training and come back and run this program and develop these skills. Mim, I knew from the beginning that I want to be a teacher from like, yeah. Yeah, from, from like childhood. I even okay. remember writing an essay oh, that I want to become yeah. a teacher. Yes. But of course, like life took me on on a different directions and I came back uh, to teaching and I always ask myself, like, if something happens, should I, like, would I quit teaching? Not the university, but would I quit, quit teaching? It's like, no, I would never. Because if I can impact one person's life, I think, or two students' life throughout my teaching, and that student yeah. can go and teach another two, that's actually four. So my impact would be actually higher and bigger. And I know that I am actually uh, influencing positively a student's life. That's actually what drives me because education must be actually available and education shouldn't be actually limited to those who are privileged or who have like just an access because just because I have access. Right. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. I guess I had one follow-up question and I say this as, so I'm now a teacher. My mother is also a teacher. Like, do you have parents or is anybody in your family a teacher? Like, did it come out of nowhere or did you grow up seeing your parents do something similar? 
Uh, I must say, like, what America's was of the time. Like, I was shocked when I was in America for the first time and I was, like, studying there um, that there was actually a lot of peace kids. I mean, the kids, meaning they were, like, younger than me. And they were actually telling and labeling, the, labeling themselves saying first generation, like, you know, gr- gr- graduated like graduates like, from the university and i couldn't get it it's like what do you mean like education like isn't shouldn't be like available because in my country it's not really expensive to go to university like what do you mean the bachelor's degree and then i i actually sat back and i was like and really under like try to understand like, is it actually me for first who actually received the master's degree from my mother's side and father's side abroad like over the seas right and I was actually first generation. And no, I didn't have anybody in my family who were like uh, in academia. No. no. So it actually sums up that I am the first one who graduated and who has so much fa- passion in the mm. education. Wow. Pause and think of that. There's one part of me that's parochial. You know, speaking as someone who grew up in the United States, I, you make me wish, Benamet, that in the culture here, we were more focused on what we can learn from the rest of the world. Oh, well, in Kyrgyzstan, it's not that expensive to go to college. What could we learn from that? Is there something that we might take away instead of being so sort of focused on ourselves all the time? in that way on our system of education to take notes and one of the striking things about what you've described throughout this podcast is that that sense of a family in which no one's subordinate that's global where everyone's criticizing but learning from each other I actually have a very silly image that you've given me where i have all these goldfish in a bowl who are busy helping create more greenery and cleaning up all the gold, goldfish uh, uh droppings and i don't know if that's what one calls them and and they're sort of helping each other with their swimming and they're all now all different kinds of fish but ignore that i i just what you say to me and Mim, what you've described is, is such a beacon for a radically different way of thinking where we are looking to each other, not for a dominant paradigm, but to learn from one another to solve problems that we haven't solved as human beings and in our specific communities and industries. You just really make me think, Betterment. I'm glad that I actually made you think that Dartmouth even couldn't do and I was I, able to do it. I, I don't think that often. So it's it's a great experience. Like it, my oh head my feels gosh. warm suddenly. Yeah, I don't know, just go lift, lift weights next or something. I don't know. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I don't know. Do you think often, Mim? We should try this more, this thinking thing that Bermet said. The thinking thing? I've, I've heard good things <laughs> about it. But... Thinking. What did I learn? I started thinking. <laughs> oh, my gosh. oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I have a million questions, but I'm going, you were about to say something, I think. No, no. Um, I don't have anything to say, no. I am still I thinking. <laughs> tell us, tell us what <laughs> everyone. So take a few minutes during this podcast. I'd like you all to think for five minutes. We're all going to think silently now for a little while. Magic conversations where I grew up. You don't pause, right? Like it's like the other person pauses for a nanosecond. Um, Deborah Tan has actually studied us. And that means that you're supposed to jump in. So it's true. You. It's wow. true. This the New York speaking style. You took a yeah. breath. It's now my turn. No. Um, <laughs> And I feel like I know you never really leave the New York speaking style, even though I've no longer lived in New York and I ha- I don't live there. I haven't lived there for years. Well, you I feel don't like speak your breath. You talk along as I just did to you, right? Yeah, that's what Tannen says we do. Yes, what's, it, we're, what's... we're co- cooperatively overlapping or something like that, right? But this actually brings up an incredible question, right? So you've talked about global family, global grilling, and yet all these people from. I think you mentioned five continents early in this podcast, right? Yes. No Antarctica oh. people yet. Um, and, and I don't even think we have an Australian yet, but, but you mentioned these groups in distinct 
cultures and backgrounds and 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 I even got the idea that they're not all from some typical MBA program or anything like that, right? How do our distinct ways of communicating interplay successfully when something as simple as when we pause is different culture to culture? How are, is it working that, that these students are grilling each other when they have distinct attitudes toward um, being critical of authority, toward shame, toward when you speak and when you don't, toward how much expertise you need to have before you raise a question, blah, blah, blah. Uh, can I get your, your, your insight on that? Because you've described this incredible thing, but how does it work? Yeah. Uh, that right now, when you were actually uh, laying out the question, it actually came to my mind is like the multinational, multicultural audience what, that we have on within that hundred people. Right. And uh, of course, for example, like you speak in one language, two languages, but I mean, most of the time when the creators think only in a one language, whereas, for example, I have to think in three languages and other students also have to think in four languages, depending on uh, what's their mother language is. If Africa, South Africa has a lot of uh, languages, Ghana, I'm not sure, but so... And very mindful about, and we also have, for example, if I am saying, um, okay, this is actually the month of Ramadan. And I think through our like culture, we are also sharing the culture virtually mm. and also raising the awareness of the our own culture, our beliefs, where we respectfully express and support because it's still like we are family, right? And mm. also when it comes to also explaining this stuff and going to market research, um, right now I am teaching also one of the global certificate courses and we were behind. Mm. And then I had to share with the leader saying, hey, listen, like I know this is important, but you need to also understand that you give everything in English, that's it. And you expect us bring it in English. I have to go back and I have to translate into two languages. Mm. And then I have to make shiftings from English to Russian, from Russian to Kyrgyz. And then I have to mm. then collect the data and then translate it back. So when I'm translating back, I need to be also very, very mindful that I don't, I'm not losing the meaning, right? So these are very essential. And uh, these are also the one of the... <sighs> awareness that we have right now right uh, within the certificate programs and uh, the respect uh, mm. this is actually a professional mm. platform first of all this is not mm -hmm. actually your friendly gatherings where you're actually partying yes we party but party in our terms mm. family terms right where we are elders there is a respect that is actually you know order order in a sense slow what's actually happening and mm -hmm. they must be actually mutual respect if you want to be respected please respect the rest of others right mm. so i was gonna i was gonna ask um alejandro talked a little bit about things like hierarchy and communication styles but one thing that comes to mind for me is culturally not all cultures are okay with getting criticized by a woman for example, or taking feedback from someone who they don't perceive to be their equal. I'm not casting aspersions on any one culture. I'm just saying it's a thing that happens um, occasionally from time to time. And I guess I just wonder how you try to manage that across, to your point, multiple languages, multiple time zones, multiple cultures with the goal of, okay, you've got to get out of that way of thinking how this person is here to help you. Like, how do you get students to kind of buy into that way of thinking. Yeah. Ma'am, I had to, like, I was trying to laugh because when you said, like, criticize, right? Our students are not scared of anybody, first of all. That's awesome. No, they, just, they, they are very scared of Sebastian Groh, our dear friends. <laughs> 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 and we give extra credits if they actually get through him, his grilling. Of course, that's all uh, jokes apart. It's like, um... 
<laughs> because that's actually true. Like uh, that's very true. He actually asks very critic critical questions, which really pushes students to think further. And my students, I remember, they he asked some qu- couple of questions, and my students went and changed entirely their project, the idea, because he he, he actually pushed them think further. It is not mm. like. Uh, rotating, right, going round and round, but he actually pulled the owl from the uh, mud and said, why don't you do this or why don't you actually export the other version? And they actually changed it and brought totally new, fresh idea into the table. Mm. And though the background, right, um, one thing I can say for sure is in our old cultures, in our old cultures, there is actually respect mm. to people, like to people means who are, has actually faculties right who are teaching because we respect teachers we value teachers and also we are family and i think the way how our peers represent us to their students right Mm -hmm. if i'm not really happy with uh, one of my colleagues and i'm showing it to my students then my students won't actually respect but mm. since I said that we are family and we say, okay, if you have questions about the marketing, you can reach out to Eva. If you have actually questions about pitching or providing feedback, you can reach out to actually Tomas. And we all share our expertise where we can come in, share our expertise, and then live. So I was invited also to South African students to talk about the um, uh, platform, talk about also empathy. So, and this is how we're built. And I have never experienced actually the cultural of uh, like not listening to women. I mean, yeah, I think, and I think we also have students that are open minded and they are here to solve those inequalities and the gender. I love that. That's I wish very I could- powerful. Go ahead, man. No, I was, I was going to say that that is a powerful thing to have the students that are open-minded, but there's a little of a bit of a selection piece of you're, you're getting students who are open-minded to come and to get pushed beyond their natural boundaries. Like the students who don't want to think differently aren't going to be involved in this anyway, probably. That Those are actually people what I call stuck in the mud and they're too comfortable <laughs> in that mud. <laughs> Right. They're ready. Yes, then they're, they're ready. There is always a hand, right, that can help to pull them out from that mud. And I agree that actually there's still people that think the same way. What I think you've given us this incredible nugget here, though, that it's it's the intention with which we approach a situation. And if we go into it committed to listen, committed to be respectful, then maybe some of the biases that we all inevitably bring with us can be that, that we can get through them with that intention. I, I listened to an interview early this morning with um, Arash Javanbacht, who's written a book called um, Afraid, uh, Understanding the Purpose of Fear and Harnessing the Power of Anxiety. It was an interview Shankar Vedantam did with him. And he was talking about very intense fears, right? The fear of heights, which, which he himself suffered from, or uh, a fear you might have as a, as a first responder after having uh, been in fires or been exposed to gunshots or as a veteran, right? And, uh, or the fear of snakes or spiders. And, and he talked about how they've shown that when we have those fears, that the point is not to become fearless. He says fear is a needed part of our brains and that overcoming those fears is not about suppressing or getting rid of them. And it's about looking at the fears and cognitively understanding what's in operation. And then it's about the experience of being exposed to the thing you're afraid of and learning that it's not going to do what you are afraid it would do, right? So 
thinking about it. The snake is not really poisonous and then experiencing it. Wow, I'm being interviewed or I'm giving an interview and I might feel afraid. I personally always feel afraid when being recorded or on stage and yet nothing terrible is happening. Actually, we're having this amazing discussion. So I mentioned that not to talk about fear. Thanks for letting me just give the background but because maybe the same idea could apply to our biases and to your original question, Nim. Maybe if I walk into a situation and I come from a patriarchal background and maybe I'm used to what we like to call mansplaining, right? Maybe all the men in my family for generations have always dominated the conversation and I'm tempted to do that and to unconsciously diminish the voices of women. Maybe... If I become mindful of that and if my intention is different, then I can get through it rather than wishing I didn't have it. Now, the joke here is that I just spoke for a full three or four minutes. And so let's get the, uh, the, the mansplaining done here. But it's really a question. What do you guys think? Mim, I don't know. Like, I, like, Alejandro, I grew up in a all female house so we were not actually dominated by male i mean my father was there but my father used to tell me whatever you are doing do it never let your guard down let down stick to yourself even though if you think you are not right but you need to know that you have your family you you have me to support you You, i have your back so like since my childhood, because I was not actually as a child and I would go get into fights and I would get actually into trouble. Um, so I can say I was, yeah. I, since I grew up in the sexually female dominated house, I don't know. I cannot really speak to like patriarchy. I cannot really speak to those girls like ladies of all my fellow actually female friends that grew up in a patriarchy where maybe she was only one like daughter or whatsoever but unfortunately i can't i can't you know i'm hearing an echo between i have your back in your home and respectfully express and support which you talked about earlier mim i think you were about to jump in though what are you thinking so I think I've had a variety of experiences. I have an incredibly supportive family where it's not a patriarchy in in that inner circle in the family, kind of like you're describing. But then I've moved through these very very elite, very patriarchal spaces throughout my education, especially after high school. And so there is a way that you're always kind of at some remove. Um, My husband has heard me tell this story multiple times, but I've been on panels with a bunch of other PhDs and they all get addressed as Dr. So-and-so. And then the person's like, and we have Mim. And I'm like, really? really like but you know and i and i have to start being like well actually it's doctor and then i'm like and here we are like and i become that sort of stereotype of the academic Um, but i feel like you know there's this in in some ways i feel like i can get away with trying to claim that space because i'm very physically unintimidating right i'm i'm small and so i think they'd be like oh she can be you know sort of dramatic and loud and take up the space because she's not a big person but but there's a way that I've had to train myself to kind of overcome that and take up the space. Like, Is that a setup, just... Mim? As you experience that, uh, so what struck me about it was the need, the fact that you're having to claim something that is yeah. that is assumed for others and you're having to work right. for something that they have. Right, right. Is that, as you're experiencing it, is it on the one hand you're like, you know what, I know how to do that, I'm going to do it. Or is it something where you're in a compromised position to have to work for something that others assume? I think it's a little bit of both, mm. frankly. And I feel like I, I start off from this compromised position, but then I feel like the old New York training comes through and I'm like, oh, no, you didn't. Like, oh, no, you didn't. Like, I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, I, like I claim it. So I, but I, but I, you know, I wish I didn't have to, I guess I get is the point. I wish For it was people just... around the world who don't know the old New York training. What does that mean? <laughs> You're carrying a switchblade, like in the movies. What are we talking about here? Uh, no, but I show I think, it to us if you are. Yeah, go I'm, ahead. No, I, I have no switchblade. Um, no, but in New York, it's very much like you stand your ground. If somebody comes up to you and they try to get in your face, you're taught to kind of not back away and and say <clears> no. This is my space. Like I'm claiming it too, and you can't you can't just push me around. But there's this push for women to be nice, 
to be kind, to be gentle, you know, in, at least in some of these spaces that we move through. And so claiming things is different. I think here, ma'am, I have to also add to it. It's like uh, our parents, right? I mean, your parents are older, way older than my parents. And you are actually raised like you are a girl. You have to act like a girl. You have to smile like a girl. You have to, you know, have a long hair like a girl. So like there are so many actually disciplines and rules on how to be a woman or lady lady okay but there are no actually rules for how to be a man and so and i also see this in our my generation here in Bish- mm-hmm. here in Kyrgyz republic said so millennials because our generation was born raised during the ussr and most of the uh, mothers sat at, sat at home and they were actually raised like you need to be actually a good housewife you need to know how to cook you need to know how to clean and blah 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 and obviously my family my mother will actually raise me the same way that's why i was by the way i was in a lot of trouble with my mom too. I'm still in trouble because I don't do all this stuff. It's like, that is not what I want to do. Okay. And yeah, that's when actually my mom, my father comes in. It's like, okay, you don't want to do it. Okay. You don't do it. <laughs> but in a workplace, it's totally different. I agree with you on that too. Uh, man. It's totally different. Maybe because I work in also again, may, mainly female dominated environments. Yeah, I, I, I cannot, yeah. So I can't really speak to that patriarchy thing. But, but maybe you can make one final connection for us, um, unless you're about to interject, Mim, before we bring our conversation to a close. Mm. In this last bit, you both have made me think about what it means to, to have to claim your voice and your space what it means for someone to for, for sort of second shift duties to be imposed, which can add burden, all the household stuff you described, um, what it means for someone to have your back, what it means to be in a situation that is not uh, dominated by me, all these things. And these are food for, for thought. But I wondered if you could relate it back to the excitement that I heard you you dis, you use when you described Bermet that global family because to me there's a line that we want to draw as I've tried to listen between that atmosphere of mutual respect and support that lack of subordination that sense that we were all even comfortable criticizing each other and learning from each other that's a very striking thing you described and and I'm wondering if you can if you can draw the connection between that and what we're talking about here in the end with these very ingrained, sometimes gender subordination that, that can get imposed on all of us. You need, we need to actually go and claim our seats and we're actually invited and sat on the table and sharing the piece of bread, right? Um, and for the global class and family and really engaging with each other, this is a home. This is a home where the ideas are born, like the problem, the pain is brought, turns into actually a game. And then ideas are mm. actually then raised. And the ideas are actually reshaped. The ideas are actually in a uh, taught. And as a simple, like when you when you grow up, you leave the house to actually uh, explore the other parts of the world, right? And then we actually let those students go out and conquer the world by solving the pressing issues in our in our world in the, in the world in our community. Our end goal with this certificate program is make the social impact global scale, right? And stick with the family and always mm. have actually the house warm with the warm chocolate or tea, whatever you would like, you know? 
Elsa with the fresh bread. Yeah, it's, it's 12 a.m. and I want to eat <laughs> fresh bread. <laughs> We're going to let you eat. I want to just repeat a couple of things you said there in closing for our listeners because they're so powerful. You said, create a home where we turn our pain into a game. Wow. You then said, so that ideas are raised and reshaped. Create a home where we can turn our pain into a game so ideas are raised and then reshaped. And what you've left me with here is an incredible insight, which is that these questions of who gets to have a voice and how we create such a home aren't just for the person that gets to feel as if their voice is heard and they get to participate, though that's important, but that even more, they are for the community, the industry, and the world that needs what we might create. If we're able to gain that experience, get into and out of that mud, and use our voices in the ways you've described. But Matt, you've really given us a powerful set of ideas today. I'm so grateful um, to you. Yes, thank you so hey. much for staying up late to talk with us. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you for having me, guys. Insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG24. We hope you enjoyed this episode of What If Instead podcast with Alejandro Juarez Crawford and Miriam Plavin Masterman. If you like this story, add this show to your favorite podcast player and share What If Instead podcast with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to connect your brand to this show and its audience, visit itspmagazine.com to learn how to sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey.